London calling, YouTube London calling, everyone. And from all the way over there in Puerto Rico, I'd like to uh, reintroduce regular guest, Koki Pirates. Hello! And from all the way over in Canada, another returning guest from last week, Midnight Goddess. Good afternoon, Alex. And uh, the ever-wonderful from uh, the US, Queenie. Queenie! There you go. And so, basically, to follow on uh, before we move on to any other topics from uh, last week's opening topic, which, of course, uh, was same-sex marriage in England and Wales, uh, because uh, in this week, when, of course, everybody's been talking about the end of one sitcom, How I Met Your Mother, a um, very famous US sitcom, people were, were complaining about the sad ending, which I actually thought was, uh, was a very poignant um, ending. And um, when I think about it, sitcoms sometimes do, um, like Black Adder, for example, people said you couldn't do a sitcom set in World War I, um, you know, that it was disrespectful to the dead, that it was unpatriotic, but by the end... People loved it. It's remembered as, as, as this very poignant thing. And this week, what's happened in, in the land of sitcom um, is that same-sex marriage in the UK has been immediately embraced in the culture. Um, a, a mainstream primetime BBC One sitcom, Rev, that's Rev for Reverend, very popular show. Um, obviously, they planned this. They've done lots of research within days um, you have um, a kind of, the, the show is about a young, trendy vicar um, who is a vicar as an, an Anglican minister um, uh, who's kind of like, he's a decent guy but he's got to battle the system. He's got to battle the hierarchy, deal with the red tape. He's approached by uh, friends of his who are a same-sex couple, and they're Anglican and there's actually even a line where he says something like, God blesses your union but my church can't. Um, and he tries to get around it, but he still gets told off. He asks God what he should do, and actually, by the very end of the episode, he just thinks, screw it, and he performs uh, the service. And I think that this is kind of the BBC, which I suppose is a big British institution, just as the, the Anglican church over here is the national church built into the system, uh, where the Queen is a Christian figure, she's defender of the faith, um, we have 27 unelected bishops in our legislature. The Anglican Church really built into everything. Um, but the BBC, I think, have been trying to say, let's celebrate and embrace same-sex marriage in the UK. But at the same time, uh, there's, there's even a bit in the Eucharist scene in the episode, which is, which is it's kind of funny. Maybe laugh the first time. It's like, well, it's against the law. No, it isn't. Uh, where there's confusion. Um, it's... It exists in UK law, it exists in English and Welsh law, it doesn't exist within Anglican canon law. Um, and so I think it's a twofold question. The first part being, um, what's the significance of something being embraced into the culture in this kind of way? Um, and the second would be speaking, I think we're all Christian apostates in this room actually, and I'm an ex-Anglican, um, and it's sort of like, uh, should we put our faith in the good guys to drag a church like the Anglican Church kicking and screaming into the 21st century? And they've modernised in other ways. They've got women vicars, have done for, I think, 20 years. You know, um, or do you simply say, screw it, because we just don't think we need religion at all? Um, so, uh, starting with um, the ex-Mormon, Koki. This is actually a really interesting question. I feel as though relig the religious establishment as we know it is always lagging behind. They probably always is going to lag behind. That being mm. said, something could emerge from this kind of vacuum where some of the churches could um, sort of come into more prominence. I I'm thinking like the Unitarian Universalists. They've always been very progressive. Um, but even mm. some groups like the Quakers and such, um, that being said, like, um, it's always good, you know, if the churches do modernize, you know, there's no point in criticizing them for that. It's like, oh, yeah, so you're accepting uh, marriage. That doesn't mean God's real. It, it's stupid to bring that stuff up. But at the same time, I 
guess I don't really have that much faith in the religious establishment. When it comes to the larger institutions, you know, mm. like the Anglican Church, like the Catholic Church, which still doesn't have female priests or the Eastern Orthodox. Mm. Um, I don't know. I guess uh, part of me wants to say just, you know, screw it, forget, to, forget religion. But obviously these people are going to have to go somewhere. And there are some churches mm. that have shown to be a lot more progressive. Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, Midnight Goddess, your thoughts? Um, well, um, as you know, I'm an ex-Lutheran. Um, uh-huh. And uh, my Omi used to have this saying, and she was an absolutely wonderful woman, like she, kindest woman you'd ever meet. And uh, she used to say about uh, my gay friends, um, how much she loved them, how much she prayed for them, but it was such a pity that they were going to go to hell. Mm. And she didn't say it with any like maliciousness. She said it because that's just what she was raised to believe. And we're talking about a woman who was born in 1904. Mm. So oh, wow. it's, it's very ingrained. It was very ingrained in who she was. But mm. when she was still alive, when same-sex marriage came to Canada, and um, she was one of the first people who fought to have it in her um, fundamentalist uh, church. And uh, she was just, she's like, it's legal, you know, why are, who are we to judge um, what God's plan is if you let this become legal and, you know, things like that. So I think that it's it's kind of awesome that not only do is it happening in the UK, but the protesting that's happening isn't anti uh, mm. same sex marriage. It's why can't we have it too? Like why don't mm. we get that that freedom that that uh, egalitarian thing that we're all kind of promised? And yeah, you're really not. And it's, the biggest thing for me about it happening in the UK is because so many people in the UK are anti disestablishmentarianism you know, so so they uh, really have that, you know, the, the church rules, like the church hand, you know, mm. has the power. And because that mentality is so ingrained in things like the EDL, the BNP, um, yeah. UKIP, things of that, that nature... Um, it's a big deal that it passed in the UK, and yeah. I think that it's a it's really kind of like an awesome thing that it started there and now it's just going to kind of spread out and grow and become this big thing where everybody is human. You know, who to thunk it? You know, we've mm-hmm. gotten to a point where everyone's allowed to be human. Uh, exactly, yes. Um, and we, we got it through despite um, those 27 Anglican bishops in the, in the second chamber as part of our legislature that we have no say in. Um, and and it's, it's fantastic. And, and of course, um, last week we were, we were asking, is it um, today the UK, tomorrow the world? Um, uh, there is something I read today uh, that the EU are definitely going to ensure that uh, same-sex marriages are recognised in every single member state. And actually, when you read up on it, there are practical reasons. Like, you could be um, a same-sex couple with a child from France, and if you're driving through Italy, suddenly you're two single people with an orphan. Uh, so are you legal. serious? Like, uh, like did they just drive from one place to another and all of a sudden they don't exist yeah but because the, yeah because some countries recognize it some uh, countries don't we've got to have every european union country recognize it it is so absurd isn't it like literally well, you drop you yeah <laughs> sorry carry on. um well yeah i think that's why they they did it canada-wide all at the same time mm-hmm. so that we wouldn't have that issue uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, um, don't you think a drive through Italy would make anyone divorce and disown their child? 
Okay then. Um, but but I mean I I do think that um, once all the countries in the EU have to acknowledge, have to recognise same-sex mar- marriages and families with same-sex parents, they, they're going to go, well, we might as well allow the weddings to take place on our soil then, just bite the bullet, just go the whole hog. You, they can, you can already have Italians driving to France or driving to England to get married. So, I mean... Um, and uh, last, but by no means least, Queenie... We well, I can sympathize with uh, having your beliefs, and and I I can empathize with the stance of of not wanting to accept that maybe some things are outdated, or maybe that's not how things should be, and that sort of thing. Um, because when when I used to try to debate my mom on a religious scale, mm. because my mom. As smart as she is, is a creationist, and mm. I could not believe this when I found out. Like, and I think it took me so long to find out because th- my parents were busy working in things when I was a child. So it's not like they they had a lot of time to talk to me about their beliefs and things. But uh, she's a creationist, and I I couldn't quite wrap my head around that. I was like, "You're such a smart lady. How can you be a creationist?" And I would debate her on these things, and she – one day she just kind of snapped at me. She's like, like, basically, she doesn't know what her life is supposed to mean if none of this sort of stuff is true. If her worldview isn't true, she doesn't know what it's all been for. So yeah. there's that. And don't get me wrong. I don't think it's it's an entitlement for anyone to be a bigot. But I mean, mm. I've I've seen kind of, and I've been on both sides of this sort of fence of like absolutes and and non absolutes. Yeah. So yeah. you kind of get a a bit of perspective there. Uh, but I mean, it does take some people longer to sort mm. of accept that things will change. The only thing that never changes in life is that things change. You know. And uh, it's sort of – I think it speaks to sort of – well, I'm I'm not sure what it speaks to now that I I had a thought and it just flew off on me. But uh, that that sort of experience with my mom and and then being on the – on the position of, you know, I don't know what my sexuality is and, and uh, like, I don't know who I want to marry, but I want to be able to marry who I want sort of thing. Like, I really yeah. hope that, that same-sex marriage gets passed a lot more in the United States because I want to perform some gay weddings, man. I do. <laughs> that is, like, the one reason I got my ordainment certificate with the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster because I want to marry the fuck out of gay people. Like, seriously, once this this all goes through and, and all the United States are, are, like, gay marriage approved, then if you're gay and you want to get married, you're the top on my priority list, because I will marry the fuck out of you. But, I mean, it just speaks to, and the generation, too. Like, my mom's only, like, like she's, you know, she's not that, that far behind because she's my mom, but when you look at our perspective worldviews, there's a big difference there. So, like, I think with time and, you know, even the small progressions we make throughout generations, it's mm. the things are going to change. Um, Definitely. And it's, uh, it's, mm. Sorry, Alex. It's uh, just funny that uh, you mentioned that that's why you got ordained, uh, Queenie. Um, I did the same thing um, with the Universal Church um, to be ordained as a pagan and gypsy Um, minister because um, when it first passed in Canada and a lot of the places didn't want to perform the ceremonies so I started performing ceremonies for people because it was uh, while it was passed in the legislation there was still that kind of bigotry that had to be surpassed and after a couple years it was no longer an issue and I think it's kind of great that it's not an issue up here anymore. Uh, Koki, any more thoughts? Well, actually, I really liked what, uh, well, I guess it's not that I really liked, uh, but I think 
it was really noteworthy what Queenie's um, mother said, talking about like how she needs her beliefs. You know, it's like, what is she living for? And, mm. you know, that's when I brought up, it's like, yeah, these people who um, are in these religious institutions, they have to go somewhere. I, mm. I think that the Anglican Church is in an interesting position in that it is the state religion. It is something you mentioned that you have um, vicars holding office and whatnot. So mm. on the grounds that it has to be all-inclusive, wouldn't you say that there's a case that could be made with the Anglican Church being particularly obligated to recognize any union that exists within um, British law just because it is the state religion and everyone, you know, by virtue of um, being born British or naturalized or otherwise is a British citizen. You know, yeah. it, it seems like there's a case for that. Of course, then you could also say that it doesn't have to be distinctly Christian, which, you know, why not turn the Anglican church into like a universalist church uh, or a Unitarian you know, uh, church, which would be kind of cool. But yeah, uh, that yeah, that actually is what Prince Charles wants to um, get rid so, of uh, Christian bias and Anglicanism. Uh, yeah, he actually even wants he wants to change the title from Defender of the Faith to Defender of All Faiths. Um, so if he's king, that could happen. Wait, um, how many dragons would he have to fight? <laughs> Oh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. It, there's probably an individual dragon out to get every possible faith and denomination on the earth. So, yeah, but I'm, I'm sure the, the royals have sufficient superpowers. And I hope Queenie's listening for material. Well, yeah, I gotta draw a comic where the queen fights dragons. Exactly. That has to be a thing. Like, that cannot not be a thing now, because... I have deemed it so. Like, I will get Tinky on that shit, like, right away. I was like, Tinky, I need, to, I need you to draw the queen fighting dragons. And he's like, okay, which one? I was like, the old lady. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, old now you need to have... Now you have to have her son fighting even more dragons, because it's not just defending the faith, but all faith. No, I figured, like, the last comic or whatever, like, if it turned into, like, a major thing, like, would be the queen taking all the dragons and flying into the sun or something, and then that would be it. No one wants to watch it. Like, no one wants to read about some old duffer fighting dragons, but old lady fighting dragons is cool. Okay. When you fight, when you defend yeah, all faiths, do you I'm have to, like... Bigot oh. here. <laughs> I'm a total I'm... bigot. The prince can't fight dragons. Nope. <laughs> what I'm going to say is that when you're defending all faiths, do you mean you defend them all in England, or does he actually have to defend all of the faiths where they are? Like, you know, he needs to defend Islam in Saudi Arabia or something like that. And Yeah, and defending them against each other would get very complicated on a global scale. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> and, like, what constitutes a faith? What if someone decides to break away from his church and he just speculating on what he believes now, and for that day he believes it, but then changes his mind? Did he just create a separate faith, a religion with no followers? Oh. Yeah, th 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 this is a bit of a mindfuck, but this stuff already is, because, for example, you've got the queen who is who has secular duties as a political figure, but is also uh, a religious figure. And as queen, she has not only knighted uh, outwardly gay people, but of course, Sir Ian McKellen. Remember, Gandalf is the president of Stonewall. She has knighted a gay rights activist campaigning for same-sex marriage, and yet she's a powerful religious figure in a church where officially they still don't have it. So the emphasis is on officially, which is where, ah, to, to continue addressing what you were saying... Um, You've got two things there. First of all, like with so many things, the hierarchy says one thing, but the vicars on the ground level and your average Anglican will say something else. I don't know any Anglicans who are against same-sex marriage or anything like that. We're kind of these um, relaxed, jam and Jerusalem kind of people is, is the term that we use. It, it's, it's very much a cultural thing. There's no kind of mad, kind of ranting religion. Um, but I think that you're kind of bound by certain things, like I mentioned the, the canon law thing. And there's a line in the sitcom I mentioned 
which is a Eucharist is only a Eucharist with bread and wine. A, a, a wedding is only a wedding with a man and a woman. If you can have a wedding between two men, why not have a Eucharist with lager and crisps, uh, which I'll translate as beer and chips. Personally, I wouldn't mind if church just, just gave out beer and chips. I'd be fine with that. But there is that point of what's in canon law. But I was thinking about this because the point is it's outside of canon law. That I don't see why that makes it illegal. What essentially it means is, is that is, it's the question is, when is a wedding not a wedding? Like, when is a Eucharist not a Eucharist, right? So, um, surely, when we talk about canonicity, it could be like, if you're a Doctor Who fan, do you just watch the TV show or do you... Uh, listen to the audios, do you read the books, do you read the comic books, do you like some of the things that are arguably not canonical? So, A, couldn't it be just be optional whether individual Anglicans accept it, just as all it could be down to the individual conscience of the vicar who is asked if they say no, go to a different vicar? But B, isn't it a contradiction to say... Um, we don't officially recognise that the wedding you've performed counts as anything, but at the same time, we'll fire you for doing it because it's illegal. Because then you're like punishing somebody for nothing. That is an interesting thought, actually. But yeah, again, if it's the state church, how can something that is a union that is legally permissible not be recognized by the state church. That just seems weird. Yeah, I think they definitely need to push that point. I'm glad you raised that, because it actually hadn't exactly occurred to me. But yeah, that needs to be raised in Parliament. And, well, it's early days yet. It's only been a week of same-sex marriage in England and Wales. And um, with any luck, this will be exactly what they'll be arguing. And um, we shall be having... um, um, well, when same-sex couples who are Anglicans want to be married in the eyes of God, hopefully uh, this will be able to happen without anybody being under threat of losing their jobs. Um, so, here's hoping. Um, does anybody... I'll just throw it out to the floor if anybody else has any closing thoughts. Okay. Your mom has ah. closing thoughts. I, I, I'm sure she frequently does, Queenie. Okay, then. Okay, so, uh, some poverty myths that are debunked in uh, this here article that I have. Um, Starting with the first two, uh, number one is single mums are the problem. Uh, In reality, only 9% of low-income urban mums uh, have been single throughout their child's uh, first five years. 35%... Um, were married to or in a relationship with the child's father for that entire time. Uh, Number two, absent dads are the problem. Um, 60% of low-income dads see at least one of their children daily. Another 16% see their children weekly. Um, So, going alphabetically once again, uh, Koki, your thoughts on this? Well, um, I think it's... It's kind of... um I don't know, maybe I'm off base in picking up a some somewhat uh, puritanical mindset here. You know, it's mm. almost, I mean, yeah, I guess uh, they're talking about, like, this whole broken home idea that if someone has anything short of the most righteous family imaginable, then, of course, they're going to be punished with, you know, bad circumstances, which isn't the reason that they'll use, but I almost pick that up, you know, when they're talking about like a prosperous family, they, uh. they 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 imagine it as sort of like a righteous family, which you know isn't the reasoning. There's no logical connector be, be, with why they're poor. I just feel as though uh. I get that impression from a lot of people who talk about absent fathers being the cause of these issues or single moms. You know. Yeah, it seems to be a very common attitude in uh, in the U.S. that. They're, they're more into the into the ideal um, than in a lot of places. Um, Midnight Goddess, your thoughts? Um, well, I am a single mother of a seven-year-old boy. Mm-hmm. And um, I became a single mother because his father um, left me when I was three months pregnant 
on my birthday via text Whoa. message as he Shit. boarded a plane from Canada to Texas, which he did specifically because it is a non-reciprocal state. Now, that means that Canada cannot chase after you for child support or child benefits if you live in Texas. Um, so oh. I think that blaming um, one parent or the other, uh, whether you know they're the problem, is kind uh -huh. of um, silly because what it comes down to is what have we taught our men to be? Have we taught them to be stand up right, uh, righteous men who, um, you know, take responsibility for the seeds that they lay? Or are we blaming the women um, for being quote unquote loose and picking the wrong person to sleep with? It just seems like either way you slice it, somebody's being blamed for being sexual. And it's like, mm -hmm. look at this. It, women are at the top of this list. So it's like, oh, the Jezebels, like, you know, are at it again. And, you know, it takes two people to make a child. And it takes two people to bear that responsibility, whether they live with each other or not, um, in the same country or not. Um, uh -huh. I think it's rather disgusting that c countries can deny a child basic rights like m you know, the ability to have enough uh, money from both parents to survive. And, you know, countries are making it even harder for single parents, male or female, um, oh. to get the, the money required um, out of the other parent. So I think villainizing mothers and fathers is not the way to start solving the poverty issue if you like if you want to start fixing the poverty issue instead of villainizing those mothers and fathers let's get some education let's get some proper sex ed let's get some proper um vocational training let's get um groups that um, allow child care in high schools uh, ch groups that allow child care in universities or colleges, vocational schools that have free access. Because if you're going to make more, um, for example, on assistance or disability, um, because daycare is going to cost so much, you're not going to go put the extra money into daycare to go to that vocational school because it, in the end you're still barely struggling under the poverty line and it's they don't take that into account that not only do they not give most people especially in the US a living wage um, they are always looking to play the blame game uh. and sorry for that little tangent no no it's good it's good you're here to talk <laughs> and uh, Queenie your thoughts I'm all about that living wage. Like, you know how hard it is for one person to support a child without being preemptively rich because they don't pay living wages? And how, like, how do you expect to get a living wage is the thing. It's like, I don't even know how to get one. But uh, along those lines, you have to pay so much money to go to school, to be in debt, so you can potentially, potentially have a living wage. And how much of your time is that taking up? You have to have time to raise kids. I think somebody knocked on my door. Oh. Um, but but uh, I, I do think, uh, you know, I'm definitely with uh, what's been said on, you know, how this is, it's not the real issue. It seems almost as if to deflect it on these, this external other, you know, these broken yeah. homes. It's like, oh, yeah, no, it's not about the fact that our society doesn't give them enough money. It's just that they have these wicked, broken, you know, unwholesome families. Yeah. Again, it's just, you know, trying to um, frame it in a way that they don't take responsibility. 
you know, because obviously no one's going to be responsible for whether or not there, a divorce happens. But we're all responsible if the minimum wage is too low to live off of. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This, this... Let's be frank. In the United States, the living wage, there's no such thing as a living wage. It's, it's ridiculous. Like, I've, I've looked at um, li- moving to the United States, and it's, it's just not financially feasible having a child and having any type of medical issue. To live in the states, there's just no way it's it's doable, and I think that has more to do with why there's such a high poverty rate than whether or not someone had a shag out of wedlock and there was a baby. Mm-hmm. Indeed, indeed, uh, and yes, this this does uh, it it smacks of what. Uh, the crazy American uh, rights want people to think to keep the status quo, basically. Yeah, I think I did, I would really agree with you on that. Like, you know, and here's uh, actually kind of a statistic for you. Did you know that uh, in the um, if we're talking about the blame game here, um, did you know that 82 percent, uh, sorry, 72 percent of uh, African-American uh, children, and obviously in the United States, are born out of wedlock. Oh, right. Okay. And um, that uh, they're, they're kind of breeding this culture of it's okay to have, you know, five or six children out of wedlock and, you know, that the government will just keep giving you money and keep giving you money. But it also... It's almost like it's a it, it it seems like a genocide of sorts to me, because what it's doing is it's giving um, incentive to pull away from what could be a beautiful like family environment where you have the mother, the father, the two fathers, the two mothers, what whatever the dynamic is, but um, they're been they're giving. Um, incentives to being single parents of multiple children so it's almost like it's not worth it for a lot of people and not just in the black community but in a, a lot of different communities that it's just not worth it to stay in a situation with um, your partner um, if you have a child like, because you're not going to get the benefits you need to raise that child and that's how the U.S. is kind of um, built that structure where it's like okay you can have all these great things but like the catch is you can't you have to let us kind of take over and play daddy you know what I mean like so it's almost like going back to the days of slavery where you know the big white daddy came in and you know told everyone what to do and patted people on the head and you know, kind of a thing, and that's. It seems like it's coming back. Only now, it's a financial slavery. Yeah, um, and uh, to segue into uh, the next two, um, <laughs> with the uh, with the racial issue coming in, uh, number three, uh, black dads are the problem. Uh, among men who don't live with their children, black fathers are more likely <laughs> than white or Hispanic or uh, white or Hispanic dads to have a daily presence in their kids' lives. Number four is poor people are lazy. In, 2000, sorry, in 2004, there was at least one adult with a job in 60% of families on food stamps uh, that had uh, both kids and uh, a non-disabled working age adult. Um, Koki? Well, yeah, again, you know, it's um, trying to, you know, these two myths, which you know, you mentioned, you've already read why they're debunked. It's people trying to wash their hands of this, um, you know, saying it's a cultural thing, it's a problem, you know, with this race, or it's, um, they're just lazy. You know, the idea is, well, it can't be helped. You know, it's this whole thing. It's, oh, yeah, it has nothing to do with our system being broken or slanted in favor of the powerful. It's just, um, well, it can't be helped if this race or it can't be helped. They just don't want to, um, you know, be successful when, mm. yeah, this narrative is just, 
I don't know. I guess it's very tempting for a lot of people because who would love to say, who would love to believe that they're doing nothing wrong? Everyone wants to think that, you know? Yeah. No one wants to think that the system is slanted, that they're benefit, they're benefiting from other people's suffering. Um, so yeah, they'll just say it's their fault, which is basically what these two myths are. Uh, yeah, it smacks of um, victim blaming um, to, to justify uh, the the pile of shit that the world is right now, I guess. And Midnight Goddess, your thoughts? Um, so the whole phenomenon of um, the black culture um, now of having the single parents, um, I think part of that issue is um, uh, black men. Um, make up about, I think it is anywhere between, um, depending on the state, um, anywhere in the United States, um, anywhere between 14 and uh, 70% of the prison population. Um, and that's the men. And then, as I said before, the... Um, the amount of single parents in the black community is 72%. Uh. And uh, so what's happening is, like I said before, it's almost like um, it's the new form of slavery. It's uh. th- these um, women are being given um, money, being given services, being um, offered all of these things. Um, the more children they have, the more money they get. Um, culturally, if a woman uh, gets pregnant, she becomes the center of attention, uh, things of that nature. So that does affect um, the uh, the age, I think, that a lot of um, women in general, not just black women, but women in general, are um, having children. And I think it's, it's not, um, it's it's a matter of, the church. Let's be honest about it for a second. It's a, it's the church not teaching proper contraception, saying that you're going to go to hell if you use a condom. Um, I mean, Africa is the epitome of a prime example of why the church needs to fuck off. Mm-hmm. Not only does it have one of the um, over largest overpopulation um, issues, it's got the highest AIDS pandemic issues. It's got um, the highest poverty, one of the highest poverty rates. Like that continent is got, you know, it's their big ivory saviors that think Africa is a country, not a continent. <laughs> and um, and look how bad the church has totally screwed it up. And so, um, so yeah, the problem isn't being black, white, beige, or yellow. It's not being male or female it's not staying or going it's the church the church that is indoctrinating these people to believe that this is God's magical plan for them you know uh, because as uh, Richard uh, the Dick Coughlin said once God hates fags so much that he created a disease that would kill half of Africa just to get rid of them you know so it's I think at the end of the day, the church plays a bigger role in this than what it's actually being credited for. And it's uh-huh. it's kind of sad and disturbing if you think about it. It's like, you know, it's like the proverbial, like, dirty little secret. Um, you know, it's like you, the, the Vatican, you know, taking um, the continent of Africa into a little room and, you know, doing what it wants to it, but it's like, shh, don't tell, you know, and then that leaves you with a bunch of, you know, broken people who have children they can't take care of and have no, no source of income, no source of food and, um, are all dying. Uh. So, uh, yeah, some, go ahead. Oh, uh, Queenie, I think you're out of the room. So uh, three and four, just to clarify in case you're confused, uh, are um, black dads are the problem. Um, in fact, uh, among men who don't live with their children, black fathers are more likely 
uh, than white or Hispanic dads to have a daily presence in their kids' lives. Four, uh, poor people are lazy, is the next uh, myth. Uh, in 2004, there was at least one adult with a job in 60% of families on food stamps that had uh, both kids and a non-disabled uh, working-age adult. Uh, your thoughts? Oh, wow. Uh, sorry, I wasn't finished. Oh, oh, oh sorry, I thought yeah, you were. Go. I just wanted uh -huh. to answer the second question, which was mm. um, the laziness question. Uh -huh. um, you tell me if this is lazy. I know a woman right now who has three children. She's putting herself through school. She um, has no spouse. Um, they're divorced. He doesn't help out financially. Um, so she's going to school, working two jobs, raising three children, taking care of a household, and she still lives under the poverty line. What, what in that is lazy? And even if you're on assistance or disability and you're raising a child, that's not an easy task, especially if you're disabled, which you're yeah. automatically under the poverty line when you're um, on disability anyway. Yeah. So that was just my little blurb on that. Sorry, Queenie, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, it's fine. I want you to be able to finish. But, uh, yeah, pretty much, like, you could say poor people are lazy, but from personal experience, like, where the fuck are the jobs at? Like, mm. where are the jobs? And where, where is the living wage? Like, you know how hard you have to struggle just to be poor? Mm. And then to try to be more than that, that's even, that's like, throw some more on top of it, why don't you, you know? And yeah. it's just shit. It's complete and utter shit, and I hate it. But uh, I don't know anything about black dads being the problem. I mean, I think that's, well... I think there's judicial inequality that causes, like, black men to be in prison a lot of the time. Uh -huh. And things like that, you know, like, does does the system treat people fairly based on their race? And I think that in the terms of black men, that maybe the judicial system isn't fair to them, you know? Uh -huh. Like, there was, a, there was a, a black youth who got like 20 years in prison for, for, um, uh, I forget exactly what it was though, but, uh, he, he got, he got a hefty prison sentence, even though he was just a kid. And the same judge goes off, like gets another case in his court where this rich white kid was driving drunk, killed four people. The kid gets off with go to rehab there's wasn't that that affluenza story yeah the affluenza story it's like the kid was so rich he can't serve jail time yeah, he's, because he's, he's so rich fragile. he's too fragile, uh, so he's too fragile. Weak and uh. been handed everything his whole life and he killed four people and he got off with probation and like two years of house arrest or something it's like that. It Show me the rehab, black man. Like at a horse before. ranch or some shit. What yeah, the hell does that say about our prison system, though? It preys on the poor. Mm hmm. I mean, the, the fact so that um, we don't want to send people to it. I mean, how horribly do we treat prisoners then? We don't <laughs> want to send rich people to it, is the thing. Mm. Because there was another case of, I guess you could call it the affluenza story, where a man raped his three-year-old daughter, and he got off with probation because he's so rich he wouldn't fare well in prison. Uh, and his 18-month-old son, he was not doing that as well. Uh, he it was his daughter first, and he had got probation. And then it was his 18-month-old son. And he got probation again and eight years, eight years probation and two years house arrest because in the words of his own lawyer, he was too weak and too much of a pussy to handle jail. Uh -huh. 
Wow. See, that's the thing. It's This is basically a message saying that if you're rich, you can get away with whatever the fuck you want, but if you're poor, fuck you. Well, yeah, we'll put you in circumstances that we would not even dream of putting um, well-off people into. I mean, mm. you know, when did we, like... Uh, actually, I guess it was never really about rehabilitation, but... Like, isn't it sad how much we just disregard the fact that we want to, you know, correct people and create a safer society and instead just focus on creating these miserable circumstances where, you know, people are killing one another in prisons and um, to the point that, you know, we're going to take these people as like, yeah, we can't put them in prison. Crime and punishment. The, the focus of pr the prison system as it is, is to punish people. It's not to rehabilitate. They want you to suffer, so you'll think about it really hard and never do it again. But it doesn't work that way. Uh -huh. It never works that way. Like, I have a brother who, you know, is a wonderful human being, but he's been to jail. Oh, my gosh. I think he's in jail now for the 14th time. Since he was 13, and he's 24 now, and uh, this time he's up for bank robbery. So, uh -huh. you know, it's it's not a deterrent. He actually has said, you know, he has spent so much time in jail that he would not know how to function on the outside. So if they ever let him out, he's just going to throw a brick through the police uh, window and go back. Uh. Mm. And that's, oh. that's kind of why I was associating it to slavery, because it's that mentality, it's that Stockholm Syndrome, it's that um, I'm scared of what's different, so I'm going to stay in these shackles of poverty, mm -hmm. these shackles of drugs, these shackles of whatever. And in in Institutionalized. Yeah, it's, thank you, that's the word I was looking for, institutionalized. And uh, so I think that has a lot to do with poverty as well. Mm. Ah, and um, next up we have five and six. Uh, if you're not officially poor, you're doing okay. Uh, okay, so the federal poverty line for a family of two parents and two children in 2012 uh, was $23,283. Basic needs cost at least twice that in 615 of America's cities and regions. Six is go to college, get out of poverty. Uh, I'm sure we'll have something to say about that. Uh, in 2012, about 1.1 million people who made less than $25,000 a year uh, worked full time and were heads of um, uh, household. Uh, sorry, he heads of household had a bachelor's degree. Okay, so again, starting with Koki. Um, but yeah, the United States, uh, where they draw the poverty line. It, it, they adjust it for, like, the cost of food, I think, but not for the cost of, like, rent and stuff. You know, mm. there's just, like, this huge disconnect between um, what a lot of politicians think people need to survive and, like, you know, the actual necessities. It's mm. really sad. And the school thing... Oh, God, the school thing. Mm. Uh, I don't even know what to say. You know, um, once upon a time, only like 12% of people who graduated from high school got degrees. You know, this was a generation ago. And so, yeah, yeah. that was something pretty special. And so parents are under the impression, it's like, well, everyone who got a degree in my generation is so well off now. So let me just ship off my kids um, and then, you know, get all surprised and angry when they're not doing well. You know, um, mm. I, I don't understand why the children wouldn't be doing well or why they might resent me. I've only given them a, a what is it, a five-figure debt, a six-figure debt. Well, no, not mm. six figures. But, um, you know, it, it's just um, people want to find simple solutions to complicated problems. And mm. really simple solutions, you know, the, the point is to tackle all of the simple problems that make the complicated problem, you know, complicated. Education is one aspect of it, but there's just mm. a, a lot of, um, the resources are just 
very poorly just you know uh, a lot of the money that could be going to helping people gets caught in like the logistics of stuff and I don't know a lot of people think that cutting costs means cutting benefits which mm. really isn't true. There are a lot of ways we can make the system more efficient. But to say that, um, yeah, if the people would just get educated, they'd be better off, it's just a little myopic, you know? And uh, Midnight Goddess, your thoughts? Um, well, living... Um, the first one, um, when you're just above the poverty line, you're doing okay. Mm. Um, I personally think that's a bit of a joke. Um, because what happens, at least what's happening right now in Canada, is they're raising the minimum wage. And oh. suddenly, the price of food has gone up. Uh. The price of petrol has gone up. The price of clothing for children, which is already ridiculously expensive, um, has gone up. Uh. And so tell me what the point of raising the minimum wage was when everything around us has, uh. has just gone up. And um, we actually, in Canada, we had, in Ontario specifically, we had a premier um, that we, uh, his name was uh, Harris. Um, I cannot remember his first name, but we used to call him the hatchet because he cut um, the social programs like welfare, things like that, by hundreds of dollars um, because he believed that it would be more of an incentive for people to get, quote unquote, off their asses and get a job. Well, the problem was not only at the time was were jobs very scarce, um, there you have a family of four that was surviving off of let's say um seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars a month and uh -oh. um then you get that cut by like twenty percent. Uh -oh. That's of eviction, that's going without food, you know, uh, uh -oh. things of that nature. And I live below the poverty line. And mm. I have a degree in social work uh, mm. with a minor in Native Studies. Mm. I have my paralegal license. I have my mm. family law license. Mm. Um, and all that really did was put me in debt because then I turned around and, you know, I've, got, I've had cancer and I, I have MS and... Uh, things of that nature where I can't even get up to walk some uh -huh. days. So how am I supposed to go and um, represent a client properly in court? Uh -huh. So it's, it, it just, it's, I find it insulting because I have the education. I did quote unquote what, what the right things to do or, you know, what the white things to do are, you know? Mm. The good little girl who went and went to post secondary and got a job and you know put mm -hmm. herself through school and got the degrees and at thirty two I'm I can't work mm -hmm. and you know it's it's absolutely ridiculous to say that if you have the education you're gonna get a, a get a job because for example in Quebec college not university but college and vocational schools are free you can go to up finish high school and then you can go to college or a vocational school of your choosing in the province of quebec for free all you have to do is pay for your books uh -huh. and um which was wonderful because that's how i ended, i started getting into law yeah uh, However, um, when I went to law school, in, like to McGill, um, you get a reality check because two years at McGill before I transferred um, out into um, a different university in a different province, two years at McGill cost over $25,000. And, that, wow. and and when you think of getting your law degree, you have to do 
your pre-law, you have to do um, your specialization, you have to do your placement. All of that costs money and time. Uh And even just to take the bar exam, you're paying $2,000. So the education isn't the problem. It's the lack of funding for basic things like children's programs. Um, you know, uh, boys and girls clubs, um, you know, YMCAs, things like that. Why not teach the next generation how to avoid the mistakes of this generation rather than setting them up for failure in a continual spiral of people who are, are uh, like in a cycle of helplessness where they can't they can't survive without the government programs or assistance or things of that nature to afford medication, to afford food, to afford just the basics of keeping a roof over their head and food in the children's belly. You know, so yeah. I, I just find it a tad insulting that they, that they would say just so casually, oh, just get an education, you know. It's yeah. it's ridiculous because that education is going to end up if if you end up in a situation similar to mine, heaven forbid, you're going to end up having you know hundreds of thousands of debt, and be, I'm I'm going to pay that off till the day I die. You know, so uh, yeah, I I think it's just they're setting this generation up for failure instead of setting them up for success. And I think that is what is going to make the poverty line bigger and that, and Uh and it's going to cause a whole generation of people who cannot support themselves, who are going to rely on food banks, who are going to rely on uh, things uh, from the government and they're going to rely on, you know, um, resources that eventually are just going to dry up because the 1% doesn't want to help out the 99. They never have wanted to, and they're never going to, and they never will want to. So um, that is just kind of my thoughts on that particular uh, portion of this podcast. I have to say, this is um, this is the most depressing segment we've ever done on this show. <laughs> um, I don't know why I'm laughing. Uh, sorry, Queenie. On the, on that note, oh, just, any thoughts? Before you start, Queenie, yeah. sorry to interrupt you again. I have this habit of doing that. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, it's, it's all just a comment to you. Know this has been the most depressing that we've done on on London After Midnight. But really, sometimes the truth sucks, but we still have to say it. Because, you know, I'd rather be slapped in the face with the truth than have my uh, rug ripped out from under me because of a lie. Absolutely, absolutely. And, yes, it's all all good inputs. And, um, Queenie, do you have anything to add? I'm looking to go through school through the VA's of Oak Rehab, and I honestly don't know if it's going to work. Like, mm. even if they pay for me to go through school and I get a degree and all this stuff, like, am I going to be able to get a job? Where will I have to work at? What am I going to have to do? There's all these questions. And there's no longer the certainty that having a degree will get you a job or that having mm. a, a certain kind of degree will get you the kind of pay you deserve. It's, there's mm-hmm. nothing. There's this, I don't know, like, I've been feeling it really lately. There's this it's like you're struggling and there's no way to know for certain if it's even working like you don't even know what you're fighting for after a while yeah you know yeah mm. if i might add something to something that um midnight goddess ended on you know the idea mm. that um the 1% has historically not cared about the 99 and you know it's going to be they're probably not going to care about us in the future i'd like to think that there's a growing school of thought particularly in economics 
that people are beginning to realize the need for everyone in the society to be well. No matter how wealthy you are, the only way you can accumulate wealth is dependent on people being able to spend the money. And so mm. I guess, you know, apart from the poverty line being too low or something, even if they were okay, do you really want a society that's just okay? Suppose you're a business owner or something. You don't want people to be okay. You want people to uh, be able to give you business, people who um, will, you know, buy things, even if they're just luxury items, just so that you can be more productive and we can have a more fruitful society that everyone has an input as to what gets invented from video game consoles to My Little Pony stickers to, I don't know, um, dildos that are operated over the internet. You know, the point is that if we want to progress, the masses, the poor, the middle class, um, you know, not just the upper class, we're all this huge force towards um, mm. innovation. And, um, you know, we don't want people to be just above the poverty line. We want to have a prosperous society that, you know, everyone can help advance. And in order to do that, people need, you know, the financial resources to spend money, to take time to um, come up with their own businesses. You know, um, or even just to enjoy life, to be inspired to write a book. Who knows? I mean, it's not just about helping the poor survive, but it's about producing a society where people can be happy and prosper. Uh, yeah, that all makes um, perfect sense. But how many people would call you a goddamn communist? <laughs> My parents call me a communist all the time. <laughs> Well, I'm I mean, a dirty, dirty socialist. Well, my parents well, seem to think that communists and socialists are like interchangeable terms. Mm. Yeah, it, it's just sad because even we're talking, I'm talking about like mainstream economics, you know, when we talk about stimulus yeah. packages. I mean, um, you know, a lot of people um, complain about, for example, I'm not sure if this is a problem in... Um, Canada or the UK. In the United States, a lot of people talk about projects that are bridges to nowhere. You know, the government mm. poured in money to um, to build a bridge or some infrastructure project that, you know, just to do that. And it's like, really, what these people are being hired to do is spend the money that the government gives them. Because we know that the economy does not work if people don't have money. But, you know, um, and don't get me wrong, I'd rather it, you know, if we can, like, pay people and at the same time get a bridge built, that's wonderful. But I, I just mean to say that um, it's important to realize that, um, you know, we need to give money to people even when it's not to build a bridge or, you know, fix the sewers or something. It's just that we need to spend money on the welfare of the people because that's how a society works. That's how a society can be prosperous. Um, Alex, if I may respond to his uh, uh -huh. question, um, uh -huh. we don't really have that, um, the whole bridges to nowhere concept in Canada because a lot of our extra finances will go to improving our medical system, will go to improving our, our cancer, um, you know, research, uh, will go to um, basically making sure that everybody's got the health care that they need. Um, because we do have the universal health care system. So um, we put a lot of money back into things that will make us better in like more of the long term. It doesn't have necessarily benefit the right this moment, but we're putting money away, for example, for the future generations to have, you know, the health care that we are so fortunate to have right now. Whereas in the United States, my medication alone um, would be over four thousand dollars a month. So yeah, uh, uh. it's basically uh, that shows some understanding that a government, or rather a society, not just the government, needs to invest in its people. That sounds a lot better. Don't get me yeah. wrong; we need bridges and roads, but yeah, yeah, we need bridges and roads, but not bridges to nowhere. I find. You know, that particular concept of just building it for the sake of building it when, you know, in Quebec, like I said, college is free. You know, it took a few years to save up for that. And Quebec itself agreed to have a higher tax rate 
in order for, to make this possible. But by the 1970s, you could go to college for free. Aha, uh-huh. and uh, next up on the list of uh, debunked poverty myths is uh, we're winning the war on poverty. Uh, the number of households with children living on less than $2 a day per person has grown 160% since 1996 uh, to uh, one point... Uh, sorry. I don't know how to read this. 1.65, 1.65 million families uh, in 2011. Uh, and then uh, the days of old ladies eating cat food are over. Uh, the share of elderly single women living in extreme poverty uh, jumped 31% from 2011 to 2012. And apologies for my brain fart just then. A uh, bit frazzled. And Koki, uh, your thoughts? Well, when it comes to uh, winning the war of poverty, I guess there are a lot of ways we can phrase it. Where right now is an interesting time period because um, the difference between the poorer nations and the wealthier nations is shrinking, but the differences between the rich and the poor within those countries is tending to rise. Now, if I recall the article, the study they linked was an America-specific one, which mm. has a pretty nasty problem when it comes to wealth inequality, you know, one that mm. seems to be growing, it's still not as bad as, like, say, Latin America or Africa, where inequality is really bad. But it's mm. particularly tragic when a nation is continuing to become more prosperous and, you know, yet at the same time, there are more and more poor people within that nation. But, you know, whether or not we're saying we're mm. winning the war on poverty, obviously we've lifted Many people, um, you know, through charity, through um, trade, through, you know, doing business with more nations and having long periods of peace, you know, lots of people from the developing world, we've lifted them, you know, out of, well, starvation conditions and um, they've been able to enjoy a certain degree of prosperity. But um, it's very tragic when, you know, even when we're helping these developing nations, as well as the United States becoming more prosperous as well. Um, that more and more poor people are just being thrown under the bus, you know, because we clearly do have the money. Um, mm. Now, old people eating cat food. <laughs> I, I, I guess I don't know enough about that. Cat food is probably very yummy, so so I'm mm. glad I'm glad that myth is, um, you know, has been debunked. That those days aren't over because more people should try cat food. But um, in all seriousness, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, poverty is still um, an issue, and we there are a lot of demographics that are marginalized, which would include, you know, widows and such. Um, um I will say, my roomie uh, eats cat food pretty much every day, and she seems to love it. Is cat food a, a, a metaphor for something? Uh, no, it's just my, my, my roomie, uh, 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 well, I guess you could call her, so she literally is a cat. I was trying to be <laughs> funny, I'm sorry. Yes, uh... <laughs> okay, I thought you were, like, rooming with a lesbian or something, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, is your cat a lesbian? Um, um, I have seen her licking a vagina. Oh, well, there we that, go. That is, is usually your... a big indicator that she likes the pussy if the pussy is looking the. <laughs> I'm not sure if it counts. I think I think oh, this would be more if you, if a human did what Nissa did, you would call it autoerotic. Um, is it bizarre that that in a visual of like a human is kind of hot? Um, I would love to see somebody that's like uh, that. That's why people do yoga. <laughs> well, that is the reason why yoga was invented in India or whatever. Forget like the religious background. It was just a <laughs> bunch of monks that you know, after being chased for a while, it's like <laughs> I really wish I could just bring my mouth to my genitalia. Exactly. Exactly. Ah, right. Ha, huh, uh, Midnight Goddess, uh, your thoughts 
on auto erotic um, fellatio, etc., and the eating of cat food. No, sorry, sorry. Your um, your your thoughts on what it, whatever the serious topic was. Um, and the war on poverty, winning. Ah, uh, yes. You know. And 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 um, the the severely when they say old ladies eating cat food, the severely, um, uh, uh, what would be the word? The 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 severely like an impoverished um, elderly. Um. Well, firstly, uh, um, the I'm going to talk about the whole cat food thing. Um, mm-hmm. I had a friend of mine, um, who whose family immigrated, um from, uh, I'm not sure where, but a very small uh, village in Japan. Mm. And they didn't know English. Mm. And they tell stories to their kids um, about when they first moved to Canada that they bought pet food because they didn't, they couldn't read the English, Mm. and it was cheaper. Mm. So there's, there's, there is that kind of you know, uh, hello, hello. Sorry about that. Um, my mouse slipped and I muted myself. <laughs> Carry on. Um, so I, I do know that it, it it does happen. Um, and I think that it's a really sad state of affairs mm. when we treat our our elderly like like. The people who, who should be our our teachers, our our guides, the people we go to mm. to seek wisdom from, and who we should be revering and taking care of, are forced to buy um, products for animals just in order to ensure that they eat. Um, uh-huh. I mean, I'm not. I do not remember who said this, but. Um, you can tell the strength of a country by how it treats its weakest um, members, and we're not doing such a great job. Like not even just in the United States, but in Canada, in all sorts of places. I mean, even in some of what quote unquote the freest places in the world. Um, you know, have genocide every single day and no one notices. Uh, and I think that also has to do with the poverty um, effect as well. Um, for example, um, in Chicago, um, in a seven-month period, um, I think it was 87 people between the ages of 16 and 21, um, usually um, black men and black males were gunned down um, by police. Uh, How is that not genocide? uh, And bringing that back is because a lot of these things happened in, quote unquote, these ghetto neighborhoods that, you know, that they've built, you know, to put, uh, to put all the poor people in one spot, right? Um, like little mini um, camps for the poor, and yeah. it's 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 gotten to a point where you know what do people have to live for when they've lived in this cycle of poverty? They're you know they're eighteen, they're playing pick up ball pick up ball basketball games with ghosts, you know, and that's not going to help them achieve um, success outside of these environments because these environments through the government cuts and the government lack of funding and the government's um, just crass carelessness of its people are just going to push for everybody further and further down until we are struggling so far under the weight of the bar that it kills us. And uh, it's it's a really really saddening thing to me. Yeah, um, Queenie, any thoughts? Being poor sucks. It does, but uh, that's not the point of this, is it? <laughs> um, 
So that was very succinct, very concise. <laughs> Being four sucks. Like, like I said, after a while, you just don't want to fight anymore. I think Being Poor Sucks should be the title of this show. You should totally do that. And then everyone will get to this part, and they'll be like, oh, Queenie thought of the title. And (laughs) and then they'll be like, praise Queen. I need more thralls, so you should make it the title. And you should make sure that you put um, um, the uh, channels underneath so that I can subscribe to our lovely cookie uh, here tonight. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Actually, Koki, when did you last make a video? Yeah, I've pretty much gone off YouTube for a while. I, I don't know. Um, I'm, I was actually thinking of doing some stuff for Fapalog, but my own channel is going to be inactive indefinitely. Yes, I'm the type who likes to watch archived videos and get to know you know, what people used to believe in and things like that. So I would still subscribe to you so that I could watch your archive. Oh, I hope my archives aren't that boring. Your archives are actually quite a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. i got to think of where to take my channel next. Like, what direction should I go in? I say no. north, or gaily forward. <laughs> I like gaily that. For- gaily forward? Yes. Oh, yeah. So I'll take it gaily forward. If you're going to go forward, definitely go forward gaily. Oh, yes. That's, that's the best advice ever. Mm-hmm. Okay, then. Well, it looks like we're almost done uh, with the poverty section, so without much further ado... Ah, okay. So, uh, next up, then, our final two poverty myths are... Number nine. The homeless are drunk street people. Uh, one in 45 kids in the United States experiences homelessness each year. In New York City alone... 22,000 children are homeless. Uh, 10. Handouts are bankrupting us. In 2012, total welfare funding was uh, 0.47% of the federal budget. And of course, uh, let's not forget that the handouts we have been seeing in recent years are to the fucking banks. Uh, so, uh, Koki Pirates, uh, if you could go first on those two poverty myths. Well, okay, homelessness being drunks and, like, you know, the whole children stuff. Sounds mm. like a bit of an adventure. Um, obviously, you know, they don't know what they want to talk about. But you mentioned the handout thing. I'm just wondering, it's making us bankrupt. Who is us? I'm just wondering, <laughs> it's like, uh, if you don't give me money, then I'm going to, or if you give me money, then I'm going to be bankrupt. Yes, that that makes total sense. Okay, <laughs> so um, we're going to have a poorer nation, uh, <laughs> but it's better than being a bankrupt nation that doesn't give money to the poor. Okay, but yes, um, I'm just wondering, how many I don't know, I feel like a lot of people get um, into alcohol and drugs and homelessness just because when you're having difficulty getting a job, it's incredibly boring. I mean, you know, how many people get into drugs just because it's something to do, you know? Yeah. But, um, yeah, obviously this is some heavy stuff, but we've been talking about depressing stuff for a while, so... Yeah, I'm just going to poke fun at that idea that we're going to go bankrupt because we're receiving money. Okay. Yeah, lovely. Uh, Yes, and the number of things that our governments can apparently spend money on. Uh, But as for the the homelessness bit being, I think uh, because people want to switch their brains off when it comes to seeing the homeless, oh, if I give them money, they'll just spend it all on drugs and alcohol anyway. And I remember some years ago, a comedian over here, I, I think it was a British comedian, might, might have been American actually, sort of saying, oh, you know, he hears people say, if I, um, if I give uh, uh, the money, they'll spend it on drugs and alcohol. Well, A, what the fuck do you think I was going to spend it on? And B, if I were homeless, yeah, I'm going to want to get drunk. I'm going to want to get high. You know, ironically uh, enough, the homeless people that hold up the sign 
please give me money so I can uh, buy booze. End up getting more money. Really? Yeah. Um, please give me drugs. So I, uh, please give me money so I can buy some drugs and booze. Because you know, I guess people like the little humor in it. The homeless people taking the cat <laughs> the stereotype. Um, but yeah. Um. Well, uh, if I could cut mm-hmm. in, um, mm-hmm. if uh, Koki, were you done your point? Like, yes, I don't yes, want to yes, step on your toes. Go ahead. Um, I found it really kind of funny in the article that um, they made a point of saying that there is a problem with homeless drunkenness with homeless people. Mm. Like, the way they said it, like, like homeless drunkenness is, is a problem because they're homeless. Well, if it's homeless drunkenness, don't they have to be homeless for it to not be like, yeah. you know... Uh, upside down on the ceiling drunkenness or, you know, doing the merengue drunkenness or something. Mm. And really, if if I was in a situation where I was homeless and, you know, I didn't really have much to, you know, count on and I wanted to do something to kind of, you know, lighten my brain and forget it for a while. And, yeah. you know, I think it's, it's, who are we to judge? You know, they're asking for help. We we make the choice to help or not help. And that should be the end of it. Who are we to judge? You know, let's, let's take a, a page from the Christians because this always, you know, pisses them off. Um, when, um, the, when Mary came in running from the men when she was, you know, being a prostitute and she was being a prostitute because she was below the poverty line and she ha- was taking care of her family. Mm. And they wanted to stone her to death. And mm. Jesus said, um, you without sin cast the first stone. And they all put the stones down and walked away. And he took her by the hand and he said, go forth and sin no more. And... You want to know, you know, I bet dollars to donuts here that some of the most uh, vocal anti, you know, uh, vocal people about the homelessness and poverty issues, um, about not liking it and about making these stupid myths to make people look, you know, like degenerates and reprobates because they're, Mm. um, you know, they happen to be poor, um, I think it's a lot of the you know, Abrahamic faiths, to be honest. You know, uh-huh. you know, look at me. I'm giving this money to the homeless person. You know, like which is the which is that person going to appreciate the money more from? Somebody who came in the quiet of the night and handed it to him or her, and not made a big fuss, and it was appreciated, and that person did uh-huh. whatever they did. Or that big, loud, you know, boisterous man who's got his girlfriend on his arm who hands the guy a 20. You know, in both cases it's appreciated, but in which case is it more sincere? So I think we have a case of a lot of quiet people who are trying to solve the problem and actually working towards solving the problem. And then you have the loud um, morons who hate anybody who isn't like them and who want to completely abolish the middle class, who are screaming up and down like little two-year-olds having tantrums, going, but that's my ball, and I don't want to share, daddy. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 that's how it feels. It feels like uh, we're dealing with people who are just spoiled and having tantrums. And, you know, so what if the, if the person wants a damn drink, you know? It, yeah. They're the ones who have to survive. See, the thing is, like, I'm still privileged enough to be drunk and disorderly in my own home, which doesn't really count as being drunk and disorderly, or at least I'd have to be pretty fucking disorderly. If you're homeless, you've got no choice. And now in the UK, you're not supposed to walk around on the streets with an open container of alcohol. But if you're homeless, you've got no choice. In other words, you can be drunk if you're not homeless, 
But if you are homeless, exactly what option do you have in terms of your drunkenness? Well, well, we could play the loophole game. Technically, if you are homeless, then you are nomadic. And therefore, anywhere you rest your head for the night would be a <laughs> So we could I, just play total loopholes. I'd, I'd, I'd love to see if that defense would work. I have a terrible feeling it wouldn't. It may um, not, but um, in B.C., uh, British Columbia, they did uh, in to get the government to help with more subsidized housing and things like that, they did a tent city where um, people were, you know, protesting and spending months and months, even in, like, the winter, in tents till the government finally caved and built subsidized, more subsidized housing to uh-huh. help the um, homelessness issue. So we should, like, in the, in the famous words of V from, from, of v from Vendetta, um... A people should not fear their government. The government should fear their people. Because at the end of the day, we're the ones with the power. If we get together and we want, really want to fix this, they've, they've got to listen to us. And that's only going to happen when we all put our egos aside and work together. Aha. Uh-huh. Yes, I, I feel like, uh, like a, another verse of uh, Do You Hear the People Sing coming along. I know. I love that. I love that song. <laughs> Take to the barricades. <laughs> ah, okay. Do we have any uh, closing thoughts on the subject of poverty for anybody listening who hasn't already reached for the razor blades? If I think I were. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I think that um, when it, regardless of your financial position. Try and make the best of it. Try and make small things matter because it it is the small stuff that in the end of the day, they're going to remember. You know, I grew up poor and I don't remember, you know, how many times a week I had to eat potatoes. I don't remember not having new clothes or, you know, or caring about that. I remember the hugs, the kisses, the love the times I colored, the times I got read to, the family time we spent together, that's what matters at the end of the day. The dollar should not define you, and it's time for the government to wake up and start helping its people instead of hindering them. Uh Aha, wise words there, and Koki, closing thoughts? Yeah, I feel kind of silly now after following those books. I was going to say that if I were homeless, uh, I don't drink, but I'd like to think I'd be the friendliest drunk imaginable. Breaking into hey. stuff spontaneously and just hoping everyone has a better day. Ah, uh, yes. The best the best kind of drunk is a friendly drunk. The kind who uh-huh. asked lamppost to be their valentine. Those are my favorites. <laughs> oh, yeah, I would do elaborate public um, what's your mode, proposals for the fire hydrant. You know, have like a crowd of people holding up the sign, will you marry me? The fire hydrant will be so Mm -hmm. touched. She must be a very lucky fire hydrant. I don't know, I I find the red a bit whorish, personally, but what can I say? (laughs) But have you seen that blue one? I mean, it's so gauche. Blue and yellow is so 1992. Okay, so uh, next up, uh, is a video um, that I, I'm rather glad it's uh, it, it's from it's from here in the UK uh, and feels very British because the, the French a while back did a kind of narrative movie equivalent um, and this is the the kind of uh, what's the term hidden camera uh, real life experience um, it's uh, reverse sexism. It's, I think it's a bit exaggerated, but it, but it's uh, uh, what it, what if um, women have the attitudes towards men that men do towards women? A lot of it is sexual objectification or creepy, unwelcome uh, 
advancement. I, uh, not all of it, though. I don't think all of this... Uh, linked in the description, of course. <coughs> I don't think a lot of this happens with a huge amount of frequency. I wouldn't say it did in London from what I've seen. Um, uh, there are kinds of men who act like this towards women. I would also say, obviously, in some ways it's a bit flawed. Um, well, the main thing would be that, uh, although, yes, the, the, the men that she approaches to say, do you want to go fuck? Um, they do actually say no. But if they had said yes, obviously men are far less likely to be slut-shamed. In fact, it would go the other way, I think, of I'm a man, I'm meant to be a walking erection. So if a woman is propositioned in that way and agrees to it, it's, it's a double sexism thing. A woman says yes, she's a slut. Um, a man uh, says no, he's a puff. So you kind of have the opposite stigma. Um, but these were men who actually did decline, but though one of them was at work, and I would say personally as a man I think I would be a bit creeped out by it. Um, although that uh, I would say that uh, she was rather attractive. Uh, we're going to go reverse alphabetical. So on uh, Get Your Ass Out, Mate, the reverse sexism video, uh, you're, and you've only just seen it, so it's fresh in your mind. Uh, so, uh, Midnight Goddess, your thoughts? Well, it's about damn time I get to talk. I mean, you just go on and on. I mean, you men, you just gossip, and you say nothing of any <laughs> substance, and yeah, and yeah, and yeah, and yeah, and do you have to go on and on about how you feel about <laughs> everything? Can't we just, you know, jump into bed, have a shag, and you just fuck off by the time I'm putting my pants on, you know? <laughs> like... <laughs> I, I, I know I came at that a bit joking, but, you know, like, that's how, mm -hmm. like, believe it or not, that's not very exaggerated from in the video. It's not that exaggerated. Um, you know, walking down the street, getting propositioned, you know, and that one gentleman in the video who said yes automatically assumed she was a prostitute. He said, well, let's go to my flat and I'll stop at the bank first. Ah. So not mm -hmm. only is it, you know, she's using a tactic that a man would use, but he automatically assumes she was a prostitute because of it. But, mm. you know, where a man would just be, you know, a man who's getting his rocks off. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think the video itself, it was good they, that they made it. Um, yep. And I think, you know, it'd be really kind of interesting for men to walk a mile in, a woman, in women's shoes. And I think, but by the same token, I'd love to be a man for a day. <laughs> but it would have to be a snowy day. Because I don't care what any woman tells you. We all want to see what it's like to oh. pee our name in the snow. <laughs> if, a <woman> says, <coughs> if a woman says she doesn't, she's lying. Uh -huh. um, but... Um, I think it was it was a good way to illustrate the like they did over like emphasize certain things like you know when she was staring at that man you know uh -huh. very kind of creepily um you know as as a woman you know I can tell you I go into certain clubs or bars and peop men there's always that one or two guys who just kind of look at you and they just they don't come up and talk to you they just kind of watch you all night. It's mm. it's really quite creepy. Well, they might just be shy. Um, but, no, uh, that leery like you know that leering like I just cut the I cut the head off of my mom and it's in my backpack kind of thing. Ah, uh, okay. You know. Um, but yes. Yeah, and the worst well, offenders in there are the construction guys and. I had to tell you, I had to actually stop and laugh when he mm. said, you can't talk to me like that. Mm. You know, because in any other situation, um, especially like around the, in the little town I live, when they're doing construction and you're in the summer wearing a summer dress and walking down the road, you're getting whistled at, you're getting catcalled, you're getting, hey, baby, why don't you bring some of that sugar over here? 
you know, or I'm, I'm, I'm boiling hot, come cool me down, you know, and if, and, but for a woman to do it to the, to the construction guy, and he says, you can't talk to me like that, that's profound, like, how does, how do they think we feel, you know, it's like, you want to say, you know, you know, to the man who stared at my ass today, thank you for making me feel uncomfortable in my own skin for the rest of the day. You know, and and people don't realize that one look or one comment, even for the most independent, strong, self-assured woman, it can have a very deep effect on them whether they want to admit it or not. And mm-hmm. it's about time that people realize that, yes, sexism does exist when it comes to men. I, I am not one of those people who thinks that, you know, only the, the women got, like, the shitty end of that stick. I think that men need more rights as well to become an egalitarian society. However, um, if we're just sticking to this particular video, uh, mm. she demonstrated... Um, what women go through on like a daily basis. And yeah, I think it, it was very well done. And mm. the guys who did it had to be good sports. Like that was, yeah. And I, I think you have to admire her because you sort of think that takes you, could be a, you could be arrested for that. <laughs> you could be attacked. But, you could be raped. You're, Cause you're, you're mm. essentially walking up to men and saying, Hey, you want to go back to my place? Hmm. Uh, but yeah, I suppose with something like that, because while I, I am sensitive, as you know, about certain things, because women can be pretty awful and um, yeah. and what have you. But but obviously, it's in the context of uh, a culture that um, objectifies women more than men. Women's sexuality is more of a commodity than men's, um, and there is such a thing as rape culture, and and yes, that those those things have also all have to to sort of play into it. Um, and I think one thing that was a bit weird was the shop bit, where it's like I, I only want to see a female staff member because she'll understand the product. I don't trust you to know. Oh my goodness, is... I have actually had and that happened to me. Mm. I worked for American Racing, mm. and they do rims for cars. And, okay. Like you know the sound of my voice. <coughs> my voice is very feminine and very kind of sexualized. Is that is mm. the sound of my voice? So they would call, and I was the only female on staff, and I knew, I knew my job. Like I was very good at my job, and more times than I would like to admit, I had people say, "Well, I want to talk to a man." The man knows what he's doing. And I said, well, sir, you've you've reached me, the other people, <clears throat> and I can help you. Well, I'm just going to call back later when I can talk to a man. Wow. And I knew, like, I could name every rim from the the code number, describe it physically, tell you, you know, what it was made out of. Like, I was good at my job. And so many times I was brushed off for sounding like this little you know, sexualized woman. And, Mm. you know, and then the opposite would happen where I'd have sales reps calling and calling and calling until they got me on the phone because Mm. they would flirt with me. Like, it was like I, I was just there for their entertainment while they were ordering the parts that they needed. So not only was I brushed off by some men, I was objectified in the, the next phone call. So it's mm. it's frustrating. Aha! Uh-huh. It's one of those things where it's sort of like, ah, oh, do we still have this in this day and age? Um, but, uh, okay, Koki, you saw the video uh, maybe a few hours ago or a day or two ago. Um, your thoughts? Well... Uh, Midnight Guy discovered a lot of points. You know, I thought it was especially interesting that she targeted um, construction workers at more than one point because, at more than one point, because at least in my experience, they seem to be some of the more misogynistic cat callers out there. Um, mm. The creepy stare, yeah. Oh, 
I guess um, one thing she didn't bring up was the whole, uh, have you guys ever made out before? Uh, oh, yeah. I, I think it's interesting. Oh, I must have missed of, that. I didn't uh, hear her say that. Yeah, she has two different couples of guys, or pairs of guys, if they ever made out. So, you know, it goes into the whole um, bisexuality, LOL, you know, kind of mm. thing that's going on. Um <clears throat> The whole thing, when a guy turned her down, she's like, what, are you gay? Um, <laughs> that actually <Yeah>. <laughs> happens to me, and I think that's actually a common response for a woman when she does get rejected. I, I, I guess it happens the other way around, because she was supposed to emulate the way women's report, what, are you a lesbian? But yeah, yeah. this whole, um, I'm rejected, <laughs> therefore you must be, you know, it ties into, uh, I guess, um, homophobia. Well, of course, cat 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 calling ties into homophobia. I mean, um, uh, a lot of these people cat calling certainly wouldn't appreciate it if uh, someone of the same uh, sex or gender did it to them. But it seems that they yeah. don't seem to like it if someone of the opposite sex does it to them. So why the hell do they do it? But um, they do it because yeah. they can. The the creepy stare I found especially humorous. So. Even though, you know, that poor guy, he's having this smoke. He's like, why is this woman staring at me? Is she going to kill me? But I don't know, just to look mm. at her face. Uh-huh. Yeah, I did think the whole construction worker thing has a bit of a sort of stereotype. Um, but, I, but I know it does It does happen. When it comes to the... Um, because, obviously, um, generally, men sort of thinking of lesbians as as sexual objects for, for their entertainment. It's only quite recently, of course, that we've had shipping. So now it is a thing people admit to and open about in our culture that women do fantasize about men together. It's not just men. But again, though, although it does cut both ways, culturally, um, gay and bisexual women kind of do put up with both the fact that so much quote-unquote lesbian porn is aimed at straight men uh, and also the fact that there's that sense of um, we masturbate to you but we also disapprove of you because you're still gay. <laughs> uh, that kind of reminds me of um, the fight that uh, Larry Flint had um, with the Association for Family Values. Um, when it came to the Hustler magazine, <laughs> where um, he, you know, the one of the guys who was against him, you know, it turned out later that he was one of his be biggest customers, you know, like one of the board members, you know, it, it, later on, when you it, watch the movie or you read the book, you it's, it's in yeah. the book, I don't know if they put it in the movie or not, but uh they there's actually was a board member on that committee who was buy, not only buying did the magazine whenever it came out he was buying copies because he thought you know we're going to make history and then I'm going to get rich kind of a thing <laughs> um so i think it's also that can be used as you know a backwards sexuality as well because they're not going to um you know play girl with your naked men, you know, that's just men, you know, being naked and that's fine. Whereas the, um, the, the coalition for family values, their issue was that, um, hustler was exposing the women's, uh, vaginas and breasts. So they're exposing their breasts and their vaginas and their bodies and they're using that as a form of their own sexual empowerment, especially during that time period. And um, the Center for the Coalition for Family Values is squashing that because it shows more than what they deem appropriate. And then, but Playgirl and Playboy could function without them saying deadly squat. So that's kind of my last thought on it, because, you know, they didn't care that the men were getting naked, but the moment a woman wanted to show off her vajayjay, -jay, you know, they couldn't do that. Mm. 
Uh, what I love about the US and pornography is how they bang on about being Christian, but they A, produce 80% of the world's pornography, and B, consume 80% of the world's pornography. Uh, which I suspect may have something to do with money, but maybe I'm just an old cynic, I don't know. Um, but um, the next uh, topic is quite serious, uh, because uh, Herman Cain, as we know, is not a man to dismiss. Uh, his words cannot be taken lightly. Um, gay people are like the Borg from Star Trek. Um, so, um, you know what, I, I think I can kind of see, well, I, I, it's the Borg Queen, hello, um, Koki Pirate, your thoughts? My thoughts are that, um, assimilate or die, so that's my <laughs> thought, uh, I think, I think he should stick to SimCity and Pokemon, <laughs> <laughs> But um, the whole thing about uh, gay rights not allowing dissent or anything like that, that you will be assimilated. I mean, what? Uh, how many Christians <laughs> talk, go on and on about gay people just being gay within the site? You know, like appropriately, even things like holding hands um, mm. need to... Uh, need to, like, abstain from, you know, you know, people say that gays need to abstain from holding hands or kissing in public. Um, you need to do what we say. But um, hate speech, hate speech laws, um, oh, wow. I, I guess they're trying, well, no, I don't even think they're pushing for hate speech laws. You know, they just, um, they just criticize people who are criticizing homosexuals. It's like, how dare you? Uh, what are you, mm -hmm. the Borg? I don't know. But, yes, assimilation be kind of cool if all gay people were telepathic. But yes. Uh, no, no I, I can tell you, as an LGBTQ individual, we do have a hive mind and are hell-bent on the conquest of the universe. And on that note, Midnight Goddess. Well, first of all, I have to kind of think he might be on to something. I mean that absolutely fabulous, you know, lighting where they would always be recognized when they went into a club. And I know that uh, when I went away and my gay friends stayed at my apartment, they I came home and everything was different, but it was fabulous. It's <laughs> like they do these like drive by redecorating. And mm. they want, they slowly, they just kind of like creep into your life, like creeping Sharia. Mm. And they just make tweaks and changes and, and they do it to make you happy. And mm. they just, it's, they want to do it for the betterment. But, you know, if everyone does something for the betterment, then, then how are the, the rich going to stay rich? And because if people are happy, then, um, doesn't that mean they're going to stop listening to the people that scare them? And don't they have to be scared for the war on terror to work? And then mm. they might actually think for themselves? Oh my gosh, this could just spiral out and destroy everybody. Can I just say that the, the, the whole redecorating thing really has me sold. I hope this collective just continues to grow, <laughs> absorbing us all. <laughs> Getting large enough because I'd really love to see what an interior designer would do with the cosmos. What will we see in the sky? Because <laughs> right now it's just kind of messy, you know, dots over here mm. and there. Um, maybe, maybe it'll be like um, I'm trying to think of a gay symbol right now. Hopefully, like it'll be a male insignia inside the hole of another male insignia in the sky. It'll look beautiful. Ooh, don't forget uh, with purple triangle glitter around to represent um, the bisexuals and the queers. Mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. Actually, you have to have a absolutely fabulous man dressed as a fabulous woman because, you know, the drag queens and our lovely transsexuals must be represented. That would make uh -huh. a nice constellation, actually, a drag queen constellation. We need that. Um, but yes, purple is a much better color for the sky, actually, and the stars. 
Seriously. I'm oh, all for the board. Agree. We didn't make that happen. It it, ha- it absolutely has to happen in my lifetime. I would l- I would love that. that. A purple sky. We need to start a change.org mm. petition so that we can get these absolutely wonderful Borg gay guys to come and redecorate our universe. Maybe maybe start with like a rainbow on the moon. That would be cool. Just you look in the moon and you see the rainbow like flag with the triangle in it. Yeah. Ooh. And it would make everybody happy all the time. Exactly. And and space definitely does need more rainbows. Why do we not see see more rainbows in and, space? And you know, at the end of the day, if God is real, she would be a dope ally. Why else does she make beautiful rainbows? Exactly. <laughs> Uh, actually, in all seriousness, this reminds me because there was this thing that was out on, um, but it was a photo we used last week because a double rainbow appeared over London on the very day of the first same-sex marriages ever to occur in England and Wales. Oh, that's so beautiful. Like, that couldn't have been more perfect. So we, we officially do have... Uh, the blessing of the ally God. Perfect. Which is better than, you know, the Allah God, which, you know, usually ends in messiness. Uh, I'm just thinking, because according to the biblical narrative, the rainbow came at the end of the Noah's flood, where there were mm. two of every, um, every two animal. Of every unclean <laughs> animal and seven of every, every unclean animal. Note that seven is an odd number. <laughs> <laughs> and so when they come out of the flood, God gave these polyamorous gay animals a blessing. Aha! Well, as Ricky Gervais pointed out, uh, it was all about, you know, God's covenant with men. <laughs> oh, and you know, and you know, if he started with Adam and made him in his own image, that he had to have been one sexy man. <laughs> Because then Mother Nature... Hey. Did you know that Mother Nature rearranged the sky? And it, it started mm. raining men? <laughs> and that's the origin of rainbows, people. Absolutely. Ah. Well, and on that bombshell, um, I would like to say uh, a good night from uh, London, and I, uh, my brain is too facile to think of a cool sign-off, so I'll go with my <coughs> standard nickel. And uh, good night from Koki. Geep are now a thing. Every animal will be goaded. Exactly. And a good night from Midnight Goddess. Um, good night, everybody. And just remember, if you can't love yourself... How in the hell are you supposed to love anybody else? So look in that mirror and smile, because somebody out there loves you. Uh Aha. So, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, and until next time, good night, YouTube, good night, everyone.